Turn your, uh, your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, please. The book of Jeremiah tonight, chapter 17, please. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. And uh, I'll be reading verse 7 and 8 to get started tonight. Jeremiah, chapter 17, and we'll begin at verse 7. And the Bible says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you tonight as we are on a Wednesday evening in the house of God. I know that everyone had to make a little extra effort to be here tonight, and I pray you'd bless them for it. I pray you'd encourage them. I pray you'd lift us up tonight by the preaching of your word and the singing of the hymns and, and uh, just being in your presence. And I pray, my Father, that by your spirit you'd open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person to receive the word of God. And I pray, my Father, that you might do that which is pleasing in your sight, accomplish your will. I pray that you would magnify yourself, glorify your Son, edify your people, and save the lost. And Lord, we'll certainly thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. What is character? Well, the, di the dictionary definition of character is basically this. The mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. Now, for the Christian, I would add this. The mental, moral, and spiritual qualities distinctive to an individual. You see, we have more areas of character available to us as Christians than as non-Christians. Now, in the world, many have lamented the lack of character that's evidenced in the 21st century of America. Things like honesty, integrity, responsibility, accountability, consideration, self-control, humility, loyalty, generosity, compassion, courage, sincerity, conscious, conscientiousness, punctuality, reliability, and we could add others. These are all character traits that make a person well-received and well-respected. People with some of these are the people we want to hire. These are the kind of people we want to babysit our children. These are the kind of people we want to do business with, be neighbors of, and hang around with. And the more of these qualities they possess, the better. Now, I've observed that generally the more positive character traits a person has, the happier they seem to be. And they are universally more successful. The more of those things I just read that are part of you, that are part of your character, the happier you'll be and the more successful you will be in the world. The Beatitudes are the Bible's definition of spiritual character traits that make Christians more successful, happier, and better to be around. I want to share with you three of the spiritual character traits that, if they're part of your life, will bring success and happiness. I think we all want to be successful, correct? I think we all want to be happy. Well, God tells us ways in the world, uh, in the Word, that we can be happy and we can be successful. Now, I preached a message some time ago showing how that character is taught, caught, and wrought. Not wrought, R-O-T. Wrought, W-R-O-U-G-H-T. When something is or becomes a person's character trait... It does not have to be worked at, it just automatically works itself out. Did you hear what I just said? When we begin, we have to work at character. 
But when character actually becomes part of who we are and what we are, we don't have to work at it anymore. It just, it's just there. It just manifests itself. The three things I'm going to share, if appropriated and applied, will produce happiness and success in your Christian life. And the first one we find in Psalm 34 and verse 8. We're looking at Psalm 34 verse 8 and our series is on the Beatitudes. Psalm number 34 and verse 8. My first point tonight is this, happy trust, happy trust. Look at Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Now, we all want to be blessed, amen? That word blessed means happy. And so the Bible is saying here, you can count on the Lord, and if you'll trust in him, Then you'll find happiness. If you'll trust in the Lord, there's where you'll find success and happiness. Most Christians know, or at least they say, they want to be fruitful, right? The Lord Jesus wants us to be fruitful. He says in John chapter 15, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. Jeremiah told us, that fruitfulness, as we looked in verse chapter 17, fruitfulness comes from trusting the Lord. And the blessing that's mentioned in verse 7 of Jeremiah is the fruitfulness of verse 8, which is the result of trusting in the Lord. And so a happy tree is a fruitful tree. And a happy Christian is a fruitful Christian. The only way a Christian can be fruitful is by trusting in the Lord. John chapter 15, verse 51. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So Jesus said, you want to bear fruit? You got to trust me. If you want to be fruitful, you got to be trusting. You can't be trusting in yourself. You can't be trusting in your abilities and your skills and your talents uh, and your education and all those good things that you have. Those are all good things. He said, but if you want to produce fruit, you got to be trusting in me. He's the vine. We're the branch. He said, you got to draw your nutrients to produce your fruit from me so that the fruit then will be the product of the nutrients from the vine. If we're drawing upon ourselves or we're drawing upon the world or we're drawing upon other things than Christ, the fruit will be of the same nature of the nutrition that we're getting from those sources. You following me? And those sources cannot produce fruit that's acceptable to God. I want you to notice, go with me now, Go back to Jeremiah chapter 17 if you can. I want you to notice something. We go to Jeremiah chapter 17. And here he talks in verse 7 about being blessed for trusting in the Lord. He talks in verse 8 about bearing fruit because we're trusting in the Lord. But then he goes to verse 9. Read verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, doesn't that seem like a strange place to put that verse? He just talked about trusting in the Lord. He talked about being fruitful. He talked about being happy and being blessed. And then he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now, why would he put that there? Because our human hearts will deceive us into thinking one of two things. Number one, we can be happy without fruit. Oh, I don't have to worry about serving the Lord. I don't have to worry about producing fruit. I don't have to worry. That's the deceitfulness of your wicked human heart. That you can be happy as a Christian without fruit. And we're talking, when we say happy, we don't mean ha, 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 happy. We mean the joy of the Lord that's deep down inside, right? So the heart will try to get you, the human heart will try to deceive you into thinking, number one, I can be happy without fruit, and number two, I can produce fruit without trusting in the Lord. 
The spiritual character trait of trust is paramount for Christians to have happiness and fruitfulness. Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see the Lord, that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in who? Him. Not himself. In him. Psalm 40, verse 4, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lie. There are also other benefits of trusting the Lord. One of the, we're looking at the main benefit of trusting the Lord is, be, is being the blessed man, being the happy Christian. But you see, the happy Christian is the one who's trusting in the Lord, and because they're trusting in the Lord, they're producing fruit, but also trusting in the Lord produces stability in your life. Psalm 125.1, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed but abideth forever. See, when we trust in the Lord, we have stability in our life. We won't be moved. We won't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. When we're trusting in the Lord, we'll be able to stand and having done all to stand. We'll be like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. Second, next, not only do we have stability, but we have courage. When we trust in the Lord, it produces courage. Psalm 11, verse 1. In the Lord put I my trust. How say you to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. What, what is David saying here? He's saying, listen, I'm not running away from d trouble and danger and enemies and opposition. I'm not going to fly away like a little bird to get away. Why? Because I put my trust in the Lord. I have courage, David's saying. My courage isn't because of me. My courage is because I've really put my trust in the Lord. And I'm going to trust Him to protect me. And I'm going to trust Him to take care of me. And I'm going to trust Him to fight my battles. Don't say to my soul, fly away to the mountain. I'm staying here. Trust in the Lord will also produce confidence. Psalm 31.1 In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. When we have our trust in the Lord, we'll never be ashamed of having our trust in the Lord. Sometimes we don't believe God, so we don't trust God. I'll tell you when you will be ashamed is when you should have trusted God and you didn't trust God. That will bring you, make you eventually ashamed. How many times as a Christian have we said, why didn't I just trust God? Why didn't I just leave that with the Lord? Why didn't I just do what the Bible says? But if we trust in the Lord, we won't be ashamed. But if we do not trust in the Lord, eventually, we're going to be ashamed. And then, trusting in the Lord brings cheerfulness. Psalm 28, 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Isn't that great? David said, I need help. I trusted the Lord. I guess what I got? I got help. And then he says this. Therefore, because I trusted in the Lord when I needed help, he gave me the help. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and my song with my song will I praise him. So that made him cheerful. He trusted in the Lord. The Lord came through, made him cheerful. He trusted in the Lord. The Lord comes through. He has courage. He trusts in the Lord, the Lord comes through, he has stability in his life. He trusts in the Lord, the Lord comes through, he has fruit. And all those things make the man the blessed man, the happy man. Now then, we all know that David's life was dotted with disappointments, defeats, and derisions. But through it all, and in it all, he was blessed or happy because he truly trusted in the Lord. Now, we can say we trust in the Lord, but David didn't just say he trusted in the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. Now then, who's the happy man? The happy man who puts his trust in the Lord. Happy trust. Number two is in Psalm 112, verse 1. Let's go there. Psalm 112. 12, verse 1. So what's the spiritual character trait? Trust. Now here's another spiritual character trait, and it's called fear. The point is happy fear. 
When we trust, we're happy. And when, we're, when we fear, we're happy. Now be careful. Psalm 112 in verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Now the word fear. All three Hebrew words translated fear have the meaning uh, of revere, reverence, and to be afraid from a sense of our own weakness. This fear is part of religious character. That's the definition in Wilson's Dictionary of the Old Testament Words. We are referencing and referring, of course, to the fear of God. Now, the condition of the natural man is not to have a fear of God. In Psalm 36, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes. And so David is telling us that the natural man doesn't care about uh, being right with God. He doesn't have a fear of God. All he does is think of himself and he flatters himself in his own eyes. Oh, you are really something, man. You are really something. As he looks in the mirror. Huh? As she looks in the mirror. Boy, oh boy, you are really... And then they fill in all kinds of, you know, superlatives in there. They flatter themselves in their own eyes. They're brave and they're courageous and they're strong and they're smart and they're beautiful and they're all these things. But they don't fear the Lord. Romans chapter 3 verse 17 and 18 says, In the way of peace have they not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And so the world has a lack of the fear of God. It says here, and the way of peace have they not known. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way of peace. But they don't know the way of peace. So since they don't know the way of peace, they don't have a fear of God before their eyes. And they can't know the peace of God and the way of peace without having a fear of God. You following me here? The blessed or happy man is he who has a relationship with God and possesses a healthy and spiritual fear of the Lord. The Christian that fears the Lord is happy because certain benefits are the fruit of fear, the fear of the Lord. What does the word mean? Reverence. When we reverence God, when we revere God, when we have a reverence for God because we understand how small and weak we are, and how great He is. When we have that fear of the Lord, here's some benefits. Number one, knowledge. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You really don't know anything until you, have, until you know to revere and reverence God. And number two, wisdom. Psalm 110, or 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. Now what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is being aware of something and having information. Knowledge is really about facts and ideas that we acquire through study and research and investigation, through observation or experience, Wisdom is the ability to discern and judge which aspects of that knowledge are true, right, lasting, and applicable to my life. I can have a lot of knowledge and understanding of these facts, but if I don't know how to make them work in my life, if I don't have the wherewithal to apply them, they're just facts. It's just stuff I know. Wisdom enables me to take the stuff I know and the facts that I am aware of and apply them in my life to be a benefit to me. Knowledge relates to facts you have learned. Wisdom is the ability to put that knowledge to good use. Oh, I want to put my comparison 
chart up. I'll show you this little comparison chart. All right, so here's the comparison chart. The basis for comparison uh, between knowledge and wisdom. All right, the collection of information and facts uh, about something or someone by learning and experience is knowledge. Wisdom is the ability to judge and make right choices. So knowledge, what is it? It's organized information. Wisdom is applied knowledge. Wisdom enables you to take what you got over there and use it. What's the nature of knowledge? It's selective. What's the nature of wisdom? It's comprehensive. The outcome of knowledge is understanding. So if I, if I have knowledge of the operation of an electrical circuit, then I have understanding of how it works, right? What is wisdom? It's judgment, discernment. What's the approach to get knowledge? Theoretical. What's the approach of wisdom? Spiritual. You see, it's all theory and knowledge, right? It's just theory. But when you have wisdom, you can put theory into practice. That's spiritual. Acquisition. Of knowledge, it is obtained or learned. Wisdom, it is developed. Knowledge is associated with the mind. Wisdom is associated with the soul. So if you just have knowledge, you have a mind that can think thoughts. But if you have wisdom, you have a soul that can apply it properly in life. All right, thank you. Put that up. So, when we have a fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge. When we have a fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom. Another benefit of fearing the Lord is obedience. Psalm 110, verse 11. Now listen again. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. So, where does wisdom come, where, what helps us have wisdom? Fearing the Lord and doing His commandments. Now, why would we do His commandments? Because we fear the Lord. Right? Why do you obey the traffic laws? Why do, why do you obey the laws of the city and state and federal government? Why do you do that? Do you always agree with them? Do you always like them? But why do you obey them? Because you're afraid. You're afraid. If you weren't, you'd go rob a bank every week. Right? If you weren't afraid of, of, of the law, you'd, you'd just go steal something out of the grocery store whenever you were hungry. But you have a fear. Because the, the government has the power to incarcerate you. To punish you. All right, now let's go. Here's the creator God. He created all the heavens and the earth. He created the entire universe. Everybody's going to give an account to God. Everybody's going to answer to God. And so when we have a fear of God, a reverence and a holy awe of the greatness and the power and the righteousness of God, we try to do what pleases Him. So we have obedience is a product of the fear of God. Here's one. Success is a product of the fear of God. All right, look with me at Psalm 112. You're right there. Look at verse 2 and 3. Now, verses 2 and 3, this is what happens to the man that fears God. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. Wow, that's a pretty successful fella. You know what it says? It says that when you have a fear of the Lord, and you're operating and you're living in that fear of the Lord, a reverence and a holy awe of God, 
Not that you're horrified, not that you're in dread that God's going to get you or He's going to hit you, but you have a healthy respect for Him because of who and what He is and what He can do. God said that you will have here, you'll have success in your family. And He said you'll have success in finances. Look at verse 3. Wealth and riches. Now, oh. You know, wealth and riches is pretty, is pretty subjective, isn't it? I mean, what one person calls wealth and riches, another person could call cause just nothing, right? I mean, there, there are people in this country who could spend $100,000 as easy as I spend $100, right? But then I can spend $100, as easily as some people can spend ten dollars. So if someone who finally could spend a hundred dollars like they spend ten, they would think they were rich, right? And if I could spend a thousand dollars like I can spend a hundred, I'd think I was rich. But I want to tell you the truth. I'm already rich. I mean, I don't have a lot of money in the bank. I'm not talking about that kind of rich. I, I, I ate all day long. I drank all day long. Not, you know, like coffee and... Okay. <laughs> a couple times today. I can take a bath or shower whenever I want. That's pretty rich. When I'm hungry, I can eat. When I'm thirsty, I can drink. When I'm cold, I can put a coat on. When it's hot, I can take a coat off. <laughs> pretty rich. Think about it. There are people in the world who think you are wealthy. Because they don't have a coat. And they don't have refrigerators full of food. And they don't have nice vehicles to drive them around or, or, or they don't have a change of clothes. They can't take a shower or a bath whenever they want to. And if they would ever change places with you, they would think they were like the king. So you're rich. And I'm rich. And when we have a fear of the Lord, he says, I'm going to make sure you're rich. I'm going to make sure you have what you need. I'm going to make sure you can take care of your family. Isn't that awesome? Go with me to Joshua. If you can find Joshua in the Old Testament. Go all the way back to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua is just before Judges. Right after Deuteronomy. And we're looking at Joshua chapter 1. Look what Joshua says in Joshua chapter 1. Look at verse 6. Now God, God is speaking to Joshua, and he says this to Joshua. Be strong and of a good courage, for under this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do all according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Why? That thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So what's he saying is going to bring prosperity to Joshua and Israel? Obedience. Right? Look at verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but shalt, thou shalt meditate therein day and night, thou shalt, thou, that thou mayest observe to do all uh, according to all that is written therein. For then... Huh? What? Oh. Don't do that. Don't mess with me like that. I thought I was reading the wrong passage. Hey, they're in church. They're blessed. All right? You don't got to say, God bless you. He's here. All right, so let's start off. Let's... do if you'll be obedient you will prosper 
wherever you go. Then he said in verse 8, if you'll keep the word of God and you'll meditate in it day and night, he said, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good what? Success. You want to be prosperous, you want to, have to be successful, you've got to obey God, you've got to be in the book. And you're not in the book because you don't fear God. You're not obedient because you don't fear God. You say, well, I fear God, then why aren't you, doing what he, why aren't you obedient? Well, I fear God, then why aren't you in the book? And when you're obedient, you'll be in the book. And when you're in the book, and when you're trying, you're doing your best by the grace of God to obey Him, you'll be successful. And it said to whatsoever you put your hand to. No wonder the man who fears the Lord's blessed or happy. He enjoys knowledge, wisdom, which enables him to be obedient, which then brings prosperity or success. Isn't that great? God looks to bless the man or woman who has the spiritual character trait of fear. So, spiritual character trait of trust. Spiritual character trait of fear. And then lastly, go with me to James. We found a beatitude in Jeremiah tonight. We found a beatitude in the Psalms. And now we're finding a beatitude in James chapter 1 and verse 12. It's happy endurance. So we have happy trust. We have happy fear. Now we have happy endurance. Now look at this. Blessed is the man. Happy is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now the word translated temptation here is the word pyrosmos. It means two things. It can be used two different ways. Number one, to put to proof. Number two, to solicit to evil. When we hear the word temptation, we usually think of the solicitation to evil, right? But it also means to put to proof or to test. Now, the Christian will face both of those during his or her lifetime. All of us in this room are going to face temptations, whether they are putting us to the proof or testing us, or they are solicitating us to evil. We're all going to have those. Now, remember that? He was put to a test, wasn't he? The test was, will you offer your son upon the altar? Do you trust me enough? Do you believe me enough? Yeah, Lord, we're all like that. We're all, oh, yeah, Lord, I believe you. Oh, yeah, I trust you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Until he asks us to do something, then we go, what? What? Huh? Abraham went all the way, didn't he? Abraham... When Abraham had his hand up like this, the Lord wasn't looking at his hand up here. You know where the Lord was looking? In his heart right here. And the Lord looking at his heart and said, man, oh man, this guy really trusts me. This guy really fears me. He really believes me. I told him that through Isaac was his seed going to be blessed. And he believed me. Because here's what he's saying. Abraham's saying, if God tells me to kill my only son, I'll do it. Because I believe God's still going to use my son to bring a seed. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he will have to raise him from the dead or something. See, that's kind of faith some of us are having a hard time with, isn't it? You see, there will be times and situations and circumstances that will prove where you are with God as a Christian. To prove whether you really trust him. Whether you really believe him whether you really fear them. Put to the proof. All right? How about solicitation of evil? Here's a good example. Jesus and Satan. Remember that? When Satan would come and he was trying to tempt Jesus to do what? To trust in himself instead of trusting in, in the Father. There are going to be times and situations and circumstances that have the possibility of luring you away to sin. But James says this, 
Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. The word endureth is hupom and o. It means this, to undergo with fortitude, to persevere, to take patiently. It has the idea of coming through on the victory side. Just like Abraham did. He came through on the victory side. Just like Jesus did. He came through on the victory side. You see, Abraham was tested or tempted to prove him. He, he succeeded. Jesus was trusting God. Jesus, or James is also careful, I want you to understand this, to distinguish between the two. Look at James chapter 1, or chapter 5, or chapter 1, I'm sorry. Look at chapter 1, look at verse 13, now. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with sin, neither evil, neither tempteth he any man. So the first thing God says is, I want you to understand, what I said in verse 12 was testing to prove. You to do evil. God will never put something in your way to see if you'll do evil. Okay? God will never bring it, you know, he'll never make a can of beer come in front of your nose. He won't do that. But look what it says. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of what? His own lusts. So God never tempts us with evil. But even overcoming the solicitations of evil is a kind of putting to proof, isn't it? in that it shows where we are spiritually. So God says, you know, maybe I'll have you in a place where you're really going to have to trust me and you're really going to have to believe me and uh, I'll come through at the last second, at the very last second I'll come through. That's proving. But the devil comes along and he says, I'm going to try to get you to disobey God. I'm going to try to do, get you to do something sinful. I'm going to try to get you to do something evil. And he's going to show you something or put something in your ear or in your face or whatever he's going to try to do to get you into sin. Where, where, where are you spiritually? Where are you spiritually? If you endure that and come out on the victory side, it ends up being kind of a proof anyway, doesn't it? Because it proves where you were spiritually at the time of temptation. It shows where you are in your Christian walk. But James is saying the, the guy who's blessed is the guy who comes out on the victory side. The guy who's happy is the guy that passed the test, that waited till the last second and And he didn't get bitter with God, and now he's happy because he trusted God. Who's the other guy? Solicitation to evil comes, and he just stood his ground, and he wouldn't look, and he wouldn't do it, and he, he, just, he just read his Bible, and he kept singing hymns, and, he just, and finally the evil temptation went away, and he didn't give in to it. Woohoo! He's happy, isn't he? Victors are always happy. Losers are always sad. Look at James chapter 5 and verse 11. We're almost done. James chapter 5, verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. He's talking about that endured, you know, come out on the other side of victory. You have heard the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Job trusted God all the way through. And he was certainly happy when he, at the end when he did. The Lord Jesus endured. Hebrews chapter 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You know what Jesus endured? He endured the cross. And he's happy that he did. Because he has you. You know what else Jesus endured? The contradiction of sinners. 
Here was the Holy One, the Righteous One, the Sinless One, hanging on a cross while all the sinners were below him, calling him names and blaspheming him and casting aspersions in his face. And he endured that. endure. 2 Timothy 2.3 Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And again in 2 Timothy 4.5 But watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Enduring is part of true agape love. 1 Corinthians 13.7 says that charity endureth all things. You know why Jesus endured the cross? Because he loved you. You know why Jesus endured the contradiction of sinners? Because he loves you. He was willing to endure all things. You know what? It was this love that motivated the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes. Jesus said, I'm willing to endure because I love you. Paul said, I'm willing to endure because I love the churches. Are we willing to endure because we love Jesus? That's a character trait, isn't it? The Christian who endures comes through the proving and victory and is happy. He is happy for the victory, but he's also happy because his endurance does two more things. Number one, brings glory to God. 2 Thessalonians 1.4 So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. The word thankworthy means divine influence upon the heart that reflects itself in the life. You know what? When you endure grief, when you have grief because you're enduring, um, how does it put it? You're, in, you're, you're suffering wrongfully, you're being just like Jesus, aren't you? He suffered wrongfully, but he endured. Sometimes you're going to be talked about and it won't be true. Sometimes you'll be treated bad and it won't be true, won't be your fault. Sometimes things are going to happen to you that shouldn't happen to you. And Jesus said, you know what? If you endure it, you'll be happy in the end. It'll be glorifying to God. It'll be thankworthy. It'll show the divine influence upon your heart showing up in your life. The spiritual character trait of endurance produces joy and happiness and blessing in the heart and mind and life and testimony of the believer and brings favor of God. The character trait of trust, spiritual character trait, spiritual character trait of fear, and spiritual character trait of endurance will make you both happy and successful. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You know, God went through all the miraculous work of providing us His Word and preserving it unto this day for us to read. Why? Because He loves us and because He knows his truth will make us free. These character qualities in our lives as Christians. When it comes to trust, where is yours placed? Is it in the Lord? I mean really in the Lord. Or do you just trust the Lord to a certain point? You just trust him to a certain uh, hardship. You just trust them until things get to a certain level and then you bail. Do you trust in yourself or in men or in economics? Do you have a healthy and spiritual fear of the Lord that brings knowledge and wisdom? Or do you fear men, the world, the future more than you fear God? And are you a Christian that endures or undergoes temptation whether that temptation is to prove you or that temptation is a solicitation to evil. Can you come through in victory on the other side? Or are you easily defeated and proven spiritually weak or morally bereft? 
Maybe tonight we need to just say, Lord, I want to have the spiritual characteristics I heard about tonight so that I can be successful and happy and you can get to glory for it. And then lastly, if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you've never been born again, listen to me please just for a minute. Spiritual character is not possible by human endeavor or natural means. As the Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. You cannot have what we had, I talked about tonight, unless you've been saved. In order to be a spiritual person, you must be born again into God's family. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of uh, a man, but of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Being saved and being born again are synonymous. By grace through faith in Christ. And you'd like to receive him as your Savior before it's too late. If that's what you need, I want you to slip your hand up right now. Just slip it up. Let me see it. All right, you've never trusted Jesus before. All right, thank you. Father, we thank you tonight. And we praise you, dear Lord, for making Jesus available as our Savior, that he would come to earth and give himself so that we could become the children of God and go to heaven. And Father, I pray you'd help us tonight as Christians that we would allow ourselves to trust you and we would allow ourselves to fear you with that holy reverence and that we would endure because we love you. Help us tonight to have these character traits, these spiritual character traits in our lives. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn. That is number 493. I live for him who died for me. Let's sing that hymn. And if the Lord's spoken to your heart tonight and you'd like to come pray or talk to him about something, the altar's open as usual. And you're more than welcome to come and just talk to the Lord. If you have a question you need to have someone talk to you about, feel free to come. We'll be glad to sit with you and answer that question for you. Just come and see me. So you come to pray. You come to ask a question. You come to be saved. Whatever you need. If you need something, come and talk to me. If you need to pray, the altar's open. As we sing, 493. My life, my love, I give to thee, the Lamb of God who died for me. Oh, may I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. For him who died for me, how happy then my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. I now believe thou dost receive, for thou hast died that I might live and now henceforth I'll trust in thee my Savior and my God I'll live for him who died for me how happy then my life shall be I'll live for him My Savior and my God. We're going to sing that last verse. If there's something you're struggling with, 
The Bible says you can come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. Why don't you come? You can sing that last stanza. Sing along or come and pray. Oh, thou who died on Calvary to save my soul and make me free, I'll consecrate my life to thee, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life shall be I'll live for him who died for me my Savior and my God thank you Father God for uh, Lord the, 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 the tools that you give us in your word help us to endure Father God you doing it your way Lord with, with the things that we heard tonight Lord God Father, it the uh, world, flesh, and the devil constantly on an attack. But Father God, we can endure with your power. You have given us your word, Lord, and we praise you and thank you for that, Lord. And for those that are listening, watching, or here that have never come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would convince and convict them of their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll praise you and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. There will be a business meeting. All right. We're going to have a short business meeting. Well.